I will deal with the embryology of congenital anomalies of the gastrointestinal tract. I'm going to use um, clinical vignettes with um, multiple choice questions in order to use them as triggers for describing these congenital anomalies. Now let's deal with the congenital anomalies that is uh, associated with the primary intestinal loop formation and uh, rotation. So let's deal with this case. The, um, this condition occurs when the intestine fails to return to abdominal cavity in the 10th to 11th week. This is the physiological hernia that takes place from the 6th to the 10th week of intrauterine life. Uh, it is associated with other congenital anomalies. So if there is failure of uh, reduction of this hernia, which uh, one is uh, likely to occur, volvulus, ileal diverticulum, hiatal hernia, omphaloceal, or gastroschisis. Here, uh, the anomaly is uh, omphaloceal. I will talk about gastroschisis in a moment. And uh, the picture doesn't go with hiatal hernia. Hiatal hernia, as I mentioned, congenital hiatal hernia, results from uh, shortening of the esophagus, short esophagus. The, the esophagus failed to elongate uh, enough. Ileal diverticulum, we will talk about the ileal diverticulum in a moment. It is the remnant of the vitellointestinal uh, duct. And um, um, volvulus, volvulus might take place later on, but the condition itself is here on phallocele where there is failure uh, of uh, reduction of the physiological hernia. This is another case, a three-month-old baby girl present with a swollen umbilicus that has failed to heal normally. The umbilicus drains secretion and there is passage of uh, fecal material through the umbilicus at times. What's the most likely diagnosis? So this is uh, the most likely diagnosis here as the vitelline fistula. Um, this is to remind you that um, during development, this is during development, the, there is a primary intestinal loop of the midgut, and this loop will remain connected to the yolk sac through the vitellointestinal duct. This vitellointestinal duct will, uh, uh, afterwards, it will disappear, but failure of, of the duct to do so uh, results in a variety of congenital anomalies. It, uh, Remnants of the duct might result in a diverticulum, which is called Meckel's diverticulum, that is connected to the ileum. Uh, just to remind you here that uh, the proximal limb of the loop is formed of the jejunum and most of the ileum, the, only the remaining two feet of the ileum will be included in the distal limb in addition to the region of the cecum ascending colon and the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon, they form the distal limb. So the apex of this um, loop is actually is the ileum and the vitellointestinal duct is connected to the ileum and so the remaining part of it, the remnant, will form the Meckel's diverticulum that is connected to the ileum. Sometimes there is a, a connection, a fibrotic cord connected it to the umbilicus and this might predispose to volvulus, uh, that is uh, that there is twisting of the intestine during its development, it will get twisted on itself, on its mesenteries, and this is a dangerous condition. It not only results in obstruction of the uh, viscous or the tube, but it also uh, might compromise its uh, blood supply and result in ischemia and infarction. Um, the other variety is that there is a cyst formation within the uh, uh, remains of the uh, vitellointestinal uh, duct, or sometimes the um, there is a fistula, a communication with the outside, and this communicates with the ileum, as in this case. Failure uh, of uh, complete obliteration of the vitellointestinal uh, duct that communicates between the primary intestinal loop and the, um, uh, the uh, yolk sac. This is the Meckel's diverticulum. It's uh, attached to the ileum, to the antimesenteric border of the ileum. You can see this is the piece of the ileum uh, during the operation, and this is the site of the mesentery, so connected to the ileum. This is the anti-mesenteric border. It is present in about 2% of individuals and located about 2 feet from the cecum, and it's about 2 inches in, in length. It may contain some gastric and pancreatic tissue. It might get obstructed or there, it might be get perforated because of the presence of the 
gastric or pancreatic tissue and might present uh, like an acute appendicitis because of its uh, close proximity to the location of the appendix. Here you can see that it is the, this is the vitello-intestinal duct that communicates between the primary intestinal loop and the uh, yolk sac. If it uh, fails to obliterate completely, this will result in Meckel's diverticulum. Now this is another condition here. A one-day-old infant has a mass protruding through her umbilicus. Physical examination reveal an umbilical hernia. This is an umbilical hernia. It is not an omphalocele. And CT scan revealed that part of another organ is attached to the inner surface of the hernia. So what portion of the gastrointestinal tract is most likely to be attached to the umbilical hernia? In this case, again, it is the ileum that is uh, attached to the, uh, here you can see, the ileum uh, will be attached to the site of the uh, hernia. This is not an omphalocele, failure of return of the primary intestinal loop into the abdomen, but it is actually the gut tube protrudes through weakness in the muscles of the abdominal wall. And uh, so the protrusion is covered by skin here and subcutaneous tissue. It's unlike in the other cases where the protrusion is uh, not covered by skin, like in um, omphalocele or in gastroschisis. I will show these conditions to you in a moment. Now let's deal with the uh, uh, another condition, a 28-year-old woman who is 8 months pregnant goes to the outpatient clinic for her prenatal checkup and ultrasound examination of the fetus reveals gastroschisis with herniation of the small bowel into the amniotic cavity. Failure of proper formation of which of the following structures has result in this condition. So it is the failure of the uh, infolding of the lateral folds of the embryo. Uh, because during the development, there will be head-to-tail enfolding and there is a lateral enfolding and both these enfoldings will result in the inclusion of the part of the yolk sac into the body cavity leading to the formation of the gut tube. If there is failure of complete folding, um, lateral enfolding, this might result in this condition, gastroschisis, as you can see here, that uh, part of the viscera have appeared through the anterior abdominal wall and they are not protruding through the umbilical cord because as you can see here the umbilical cord does not contain the hernia the protrusion is a little bit to the right side of the hernia and it is the protrusion is not covered by a membrane like an omphalocele as we will see in a moment so which of the following congenital anomalies best describes this condition it is gastroschisis it's not omphalocele not excestrophy of the bladder or uracal cyst or a vitelline fistula. This is the omphalocele. Here, which of the following results in this condition? It is the omphalocele. And we should know what is the embryology of the formation of the uh, omphalocele. Is it abnormal closure of the body wall around the umbilicus? No, this is uh, uh, abnormal closure of the body wall around the umbilicus goes with the uh, gastroschisis. Is it hypertrophy of circular muscle fibers of the pylorus no it is uh, this is in in case of uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis abnormal rotation of the stomach no it is not a matter of abnormal rotation of the stomach because it is related to the midgut and not to the foregut where the stomach develop failure of recanalization of the duodenum no this is not duodenal atresia it is failure of physiological hernia to return to the body cavity and as you can see here that it is uh, covered by a membrane unlike in cases of gastroschisis. Uh, in fact the omphalocele in uh, many cases is uh, accompanied by congenital other congenital or chromosomal abnormalities and the prognosis of the patient is not as good as the prognosis of the gastroschisis. Gastroschisis tends to occur alone and can be uh, treated surgically with good prognosis. This is to remind you of the rotation of the midgut, that the midgut during herniation will rotate 90 degrees uh, anti-clockwise. And then when it returns back to the abdominal cavity, when uh, the uh, hernia is reduced physiologically, there is another rotation of 180 degrees anti-clockwise. So this will uh, result in uh, a total rotation of 270 degrees anti-clockwise. 
A two-day-old female infant with fever is examined by the pediatric team. Imaging reveals mild rotation of the small intestine without fixation of the mesenteries. The vessels around the duodeno-jejunal junction are obstructed and the intestine is at risk of becoming gangrenous. So this is a, a case of volvulus. Which of the following has occurred to cause the obstruction? It's not diaphragmatic atresia. Uh, it is not subhepatic cecum. It is, it's a, actually, it's a mid-gut volvulus. And the volvulus is uh, commonly associated with uh, mild rotation, as I mentioned earlier, that there is a twisting of the loop of the uh, intestine and around its mesentery, and this twisting might result in obstruction, intestinal obstruction. At the same time, it will obstruct the blood vessels and result in gangrene. This is to show you an abnormal rotation of the intestinal loop. Uh, here, the primary loop rotates uh, 90 degrees clockwise, and that's it. There is no uh, further rotation of 180 degrees during reduction, and so this will result in uh, the fact that the large intestine, the distal loop, that uh, most of it that forms large intestine, the cecum and the ascending colon, it will be on the left side of the body and the small intestine will be on the right side of the body. Of course, here volvulus might be accompanied and volvulus affecting the uh, superior mesenteric artery. Or we have a reversed rotation. So there is either abnormal rotation, only 90 degree rotation, or there is a reversed rotation. In reversed rotation, there is a total of 90 degree clockwise rotation. The details is that there is 90 degree anticlockwise rotation during herniation, and then while the duct the hernia is reduced of the primary intestinal loop, the physiological hernia, while is it reduced, there is a 180 clockwise uh, rotation. So at the beginning, there is 90 degree anticlockwise, and then there is 180 clockwise rotation. So there is a total of 90 degree clockwise rotation, a reversed rotation of the intestinal loop. This will result in the cecum and the colon, ascending colon, to be on the right side of the body. But uh, as you can see here, this will result in the transverse colon uh, being behind the duodenum and the duodenum will pass in the front of the transverse colon. Normally, the transverse colon has a mesentery and passes, uh, the mesentery is attached to the second part of the duodenum and then continues to the pancreas, but here the transverse colon will be uh, retroperitoneal in structure. Abnormalities of the rotation, like this one for example, abnormal rotation will result in the cecum to be located in the left side of the body, and um, there are sometimes abnormalities related to the position of the cecum. That is, the cecum is subhepatic in position. Actually, when the part that's going to form the cecum returns to the body uh, after the reduction of the physiological hernia, this part will be in just below the uh, just below the liver, and then it will descend downwards. While during its uh, descent, the appendix will form. And so, the, in most of the cases, the appendix attains a retrocecal position, and uh, the cecum, as it descends down, uh, it will lead to the formation of the ascending column. But in this case here, that uh, the cecum is subhepatic in position, it fuses with the liver and fails to descend down, so the appendix will have a subhepatic uh, position. These, uh, this is uh, another anomaly that uh, should be re remembered. So the appendix could be subhepatic in position, or it could be on the left side of the body because of the reverse uh, rotation. And this is uh, in addition to the other more common abnormalities in the position of the appendix. This is to show you that um, during the recanalization of the intestinal loop, uh, there might be cyst formation, there might be doubling of the uh, intestine. All these cases uh, result in uh, volvulus.